All right, so when I first started jujitsu in 2019, I think I was a month in and and like before this, I didn't even know like any martial arts or any positions or anything. My instructor puts me in a arm bar position and I think my arm ended up popping. It, it wasn't a catastrophic break or anything, but it definitely was not feeling too good. And of course, like afterwards, like I asked him like, hey, like what's this position? And you know, how do you get out of uh, an arm bar? And he basically tells me, just don't get in there. Bruh. And actually, there's a lot of truth to that. You know, like there are positions in jujitsu where your chances of, of escaping get incrementally lower and lower. But I think in every situation, there's always a response, uh, even if it's pr pretty slim to be able to escape and get out and continue the position. So today I want to focus in on the arm bars and specifically the different configurations of armbar or jujigatami that you can find yourself being put into. So thank you so much for tuning in. If you're new, please remember to like and subscribe and let's get into it. All right, so before getting into armbars, I just want to touch base on a concept that I've kind of been thinking of, which is end game positions. So I guess what are end game positions? In my mind, I've categorized end game positions as strong positions where you have a lot of control over a big portion of a segment of your opponent's body. So in a rear strangle situation, right? Like you have control over the entirety of your opponent's back, as well as controlling the upper body through your arms and lower body through your legs. So cross Ashi, or some people like to call it 411. I like to think of it as like the arm bar for the legs in a sense. In cross Ashi, you have a diagonal control over your opponent's legs and both of your legs are hidden against your opponent's attack. And for the arm bar, you have total control over your opponent's upper body. And then there is some degree of lower body control, but the main control is on the upper body torso, where the primary attack is to isolate one of your opponent's arms and then break it. So what these positions have in common are advantageous angles as well as a huge degree of control. The way I see it, in the endgame positions, your opponents need to deal with the threat of finishing before even thinking about advancing position or even countering. All in all, as attackers, it's important to work on getting to these positions and as well as finishing from these positions. So as a defender, going back to what my first coach said, is denying getting into these positions, but also being able to escape when needed. So the two instructionals that helped me with creating this have been Enter the System Arm Bars by John Danaher, as well as Systematically Attacking the Arm Bars by Goran Ryan. I found that John Danaher's instructional helped me figure out concepts and principles in the armbar position, while Goran's instructional was a very step-by-step -step inspirational take on what to do in given armbar situations and then how to chain armbars into different attacks as well as different submission systems. All right, so there are seven, technically eight different types of armbar configurations. And I just wanted to touch base on common themes and problems that we'll face whenever we're trying to attack those arm bars. All right, so the reason why there's so many different types of configurations, it's because of this. The central problems of the arm bar are for us as attackers, how do we keep the opponent down when their goal is to come up? And the reason for them to come up is to slip their elbows, but to ultimately slip out their shoulder girdle. And what I mean by that is that if the hip and the shoulder girdle connection is ultimately broken, that means the elbow slipped out and your opponent can start to escape. So I've seen many escapes from armbar, but it boils down to these three movements, I think, that will generate enough movement to release the shoulder girdle. So the first one's stacking. Now this alleviates the breaking pressure. From this position, you can slowly shimmy out your arm. Second one is the rolling escape in which you're trying to get your shoulder girdle out of the breaking fulcrum. Finally, either using your arms, elbows, or legs to trap the bottom arm to alleviate top pressure and then ultimately slip out the elbow. As you start to see more quote unquote advanced escapes, you start to realize that the escapes are basically chains to generate enough movement to start hitting these escapes. So as someone defending, keeping the arms together is crucial. That being said, there is a progression 
between the weakest grips and into stronger grips to break. And so being able to switch into different armbar positions will allow you to break these grips accordingly. So for example, if an opponent starts with a figure four, it's easier to convert it into a 10 finger or a palm to palm and then start working the breaks from there. So I don't wanna to get too deep into grip breaking in this video because I feel like grip breaking has to be seen and some a lot of the sequences have a very step-by-step -step process. But just know that when studying grip breaks, you'll come across these different types of grip breaking methods. And similar to escapes, the more advanced it becomes, it just becomes a matter of chaining these breaks for the finish. All right, so how do we control and then mitigate your opponent's movement? So number one is top hand versus bottom hand posts. So these posts will help you stop either a rolling escape or a stacking escape. The second one obviously is to control the attacking arm at all times. Um, whether or not you're trying to use a top or bottom hand post, it's always important to have one arm threaded through the attacking arm. And then third, controlling the shoulder girdle. For that, it's a matter of having your crotch as close to the shoulder girdle as possible. Number four, controlling the head with the back heel. Number five, and this one's a bit optional because it's a bit more of a dynamic control, but it's controlling the near side leg. Doing so will prevent movement from your opponent stacking you. And also it's important to note that controlling and finishing the armbar are separate things. Although being in a good place of control can definitely help when the grips finally break and to put you in a better position to start finishing. All right, so let's get into the different types of armbar configurations. So I've categorized this between four different points. Now, the green section initial points are any of the armbars that are easy to get into, but are pretty weak. And it's kind of like a starting foundation into going into other jujis if you decide to start attacking the armbar. Midway points are middle of the road armbars. Um, it's definitely stronger than initial points, but there are definitely better ways of getting a mechanical advantage. The orange endgame points are basically arm bars where finishing is pretty inevitable on the basis that you have a very strong mechanical advantage. So finally, post endgame and dilemmas. So these are juji configurations where it chains into other attacks. Sometimes some of these attacks, maybe the breaking pressure isn't there, but inevitably the movement that's generated will turn into say like an omoplata, a triangle, or inverted finishes where you're either belly down or maybe even if your back is on the floor where you're trying to finish a bottom juji. All right, so let's start with the quarter juji position. Now, this is the easiest juji to get into. However, it's also mechanically the weakest one. Without the bottom side leg controlling the torso, you become susceptible to movement with either rolling escapes or stacking escapes. And your opponent just has a lot of leeway to move. A slight advantage in this position is that the ankle trap escape won't work mechanically just because your bottom leg is already tucked behind your opponent's torso. Now, one thing that's worth mentioning about the quarter juji is that if your opponent were to separate their hands, there's a really, really good opportunity to finish a lat arm bar. Because your bottom side leg acts as like this high wedge, if the arm that you're attacking can be stuffed into the lat, then there's a really, really good point of breaking right there. As a general rule, however, it's probably better to go into other jujis than to try to force a grip break from the quarter juji position. All right, so moving on, this is the full juji position. Now, this is the position that everyone's probably familiar with. When compared to the quarter juji or even like the three quarter juji position, this one is kind of the middle of the road. From here, the three main escaping methods can all be used for potentially generating movement for the escape. That said, being able to use the bottom side leg is very useful to back heel and slow down movement. In this clip here, Eddie Bravo is explaining the spider web position, which is basically a full GG. As you can see, there's a plethora of ways of starting the position. However, whatever grip that you decide to take, there will always be a mechanical advantage as well as a disadvantage for your opponent to escape and counter. When fighting from the full juji position, there's definitely a lot of work involved in terms of your own movement and trying to use top hand posts, bottom hand posts, as well as kind of covering the legs and 
just chaining a lot of those dyna move, dynamic movements to stop your opponent from moving around. All right, so I want to touch base a bit on the lat juji position. So once the grip breaks and you're able to stuff the arm behind the lat, that's one of the strongest finishing positions for the arm bar. As a heuristic rule, if the regular finishing mechanics aren't working, a good end game point would be to stuff the arm into the lat. Usually a pushing finish can work, but also the shotgun grip finish works really well too. Now, there is a back roll escape from here, but pretty much if your arm is behind the lat, then it's pretty much game over. So the three quarter juji position is one of the harder juji configurations to get into. As well, I feel like this is an armbar position that's really underutilized. So the main difference here is that your bottom leg is taking the extra step of threading through the head and reinforcing like this double cross face position. And what this does is it prevents the rolling escape as well as if opponent decides to stack, it sets up a dilemma to go into triangle chokes. All in all, the three quarter juji, it's, it's not that it's really, really difficult to get into. It's just having the awareness to know that once the arms open up a bit that you could thread your leg through. And from there, working from a mechanically strong and mechanically better juji position than say like the full juji, for example. All right, so, so far we looked at proactive jujis. Now let's look into the reactive jujis. So these are jujis that can come about opportunistically, whether it be from a transition or even a counterattack scenario. All right, so the first up is the pillow GG position. Now, I put this in the middle of the road because between an opponent trying to stack you as well as using a rolling escape, you'll kind of work in between the two GG positions in order to work your finishes. A good way of getting into the pillow juji would be sometimes from omoplata and as well as like opportunistic roll throughs where you can have both of your legs in front of the head. In this clip here, Gordon's working towards breaking the grips and then as opponent goes through uh, opportunities to get up, he immediately transitions into that pillow juji position. On that note, the pillow juji does a really, really good job at preventing the stacking escape. However, if the finish isn't there and opponent can work towards a rolling escape, the pillow juji isn't the best position to prevent the rolling escape going in the other direction. Now, the scissor and the pillow juji are really unique in the sense that they're difficult arm bars to actually thread your legs into, which is why it makes them reactive configurations versus proactive configurations. That being said, I think the scissor juji might be the more difficult proactive juji to get into. That being said, going from a pillow juji to a scissor juji and vice versa is a pretty common occurrence. And you'll probably want to play between the two, depending on if your partner's trying to do a rolling escape or a stacking escape. As well, the pillow jujis are really nice to set up triangle attacks if your opponent decides to stack or go into roll throughs and back rolls. All right, so shoulder senkakus. Now, I'll be honest, I'm not too familiar personally with the shoulder senkakus just because I haven't physically gone into those positions myself. But from watching the instructional, the shoulder senkaku topside seems to be a transition that comes in from an opponent trying to clear a top, uh, cross face. That said, this is a very unique configuration because you don't have direct control over the cross face or the head. However, by flaring out the knees, you're able to control your opponent's ability to either stack or work the rolling escape. I've seen this clip here. So it's kind of like a teeter-totter motion, in which case you can't really move. So to end off, the bottom side shoulder senkaku, it's similar to the top side, except this comes about sometimes when opponent tries to go into a rolling escape. I've actually gotten into a bottom side shoulder senkaku once from an opponent getting up, and then I basically just locked a triangle on their shoulders. And then from there, we battled it out from a bottom side juji. All right, so one more thing that I forgot to mention, a lot of the reactive jujis tend to come about from an opponent having broke, broken their grips. Whereas the proactive jujis kind of start in where you thread it through and then your opponent has enough time to grip together and then you have to work the grip breaks separately. All in all, it seems like the proactive jujis have a slower transition time between the three different types of jujis. Whereas the reactive jujis, if you're really, really going for the armbar finish, you can end up going through a bunch of like quick transitions. like. So you go from pillow juji to, uh, to scissor juji, back to pillow juji, and then maybe if they get out a bit, they work in. You work into a uh, shoulder senkaku. 
all right so that's all that i have for this video today thank you guys so much for watching and making it all the way through if you've enjoyed this video please remember to like and subscribe also if anyone's interested in having this chart uh, you can follow me on instagram and shoot me a dm and i'll send you a link to the google drive which contains this artboard thanks again for watching and just remember if you have time to kill you have time to drill peace